uh, you again with the Food Vision 2020 have moved yourself into the pole position on the follow-up to the United Nations Food System Summit. So I'm here to not only talk to you, but I look forward to learn from your engagement in the food systems transformation action of your country and internationally. Um, I appreciate what uh, Minister Hayden has said about the a strong relationship between policy and science. So many countries are lacking that. I will talk to you about food systems thinking and the role of research and innovation, um, and especially the follow-up to the UN Food System Summit. You know, the summit was last year, but uh, the next follow-up um, activity is already next year, and there is a process until 2030 along the lines of your Food Vision 2030. So how has the summit advanced uh, uh, food system thinking? What were main outcomes from science communities? How does the public and private research and innovation system need to act now? And I dare to make a few remarks on a preliminary assessment of the summit. The Food System Summit made it clear that transformative action in food systems is fundamental to achieve the sustainable development goals. So the summit didn't come out of the blue. It came because of lack of progress to achieve especially the end hunger and uh, uh, the agricultural productivity and rural change agenda, the so-called sustainable development goal number two. Um, it generated a range of deliverables. Uh, I just want to highlight two of them. Uh, there is a plan of action, a statement of action by UN leadership, and um, there was deep engagement worldwide in dialoguing, in dialogues in um, almost uh, a thousand um, events um, and uh, in more than uh, 163 uh, member countries. The world has never talked about food in its complexities at the intense level of intensity uh, which we had uh, the last two years. So you should imagine that entering the current food price crisis and food crisis uh, is um, on a much higher level of knowledge um, well, let's come back to that, uh, whether it's uh, starting to pay off that uh, knowledge at uh, country level and global level is uh, helping us to, to cope with and to manage the current world food crisis. Speaking of a system, food system, uh, the scientific group of which um, um, my colleague Ismahana and I were members, I was chair of this, came up with this after a lot of protracted debate, by the way, with this um, framework of how we need to look at food system. Food system is not just a phrase. It needs to be uh, quantitatively tracked. It needs to uh, be uh, seen in connection to other bordering system, uh, the ecology and climate system, the health system, the economics and governance, and the science and innovation system. And the key building blocks are of course, agriculture and food industries, markets, uh, consumption, nutrition, health, and um, income and employment interconnected. The UN Secretary General's statement of action had these five points in brief. Nourish all people, boost nature-based solutions, advance equitable livelihoods, decent work and empowered communities, build resilience to vulnerability, shocks and stresses. That's of course very much the climate agenda and accelerate the means of implementation. So not just uh, uh, wishful thinking, but um, invest in the means of uh, implementation. So what were the main outcomes from science communities? Um, I give you here this structure um, of, uh, no, it's uh, not pointing. You see, uh, with, within a little red circle, 
what science and how uh, what science was supposed to do and how it was positioned in the structure of the summit machinery. It was placed for the first time for a UN food summit um, at a high level um, in the uh, structure of um, decision preparations. Uh, next to champions, to dialogues, the UN task force, and so on. So um, uh, there was um, a, a whole process with pre-summits, summits, um, we had uh, science days, and so on. So, but the message which I want to give you here, the UN this time has dared to bring in independent, an independent science body into the um, into the framework of uh, preparing for the summit. The scientific group has um, um, released these seven key science and innovation uh, proposals um, uh, for the summit. The scientific group, by the way, was uh, 28 um, leading, world leading scientists from all disciplines, from all hemispheres, uh, a, a diverse group. Uh, with the, appointed with the legitimacy of the United Nations. Let me briefly only mention uh, the uh, key points here. Number one, innovations to end hunger and increase availability and affordability of healthy diets. De-risk food systems, number two. Innovations for land credit and labor arrangements. Let's not forget agriculture still harbors the majority of child labor uh, in, uh, in the world. Number four, bioscience innovations, a key point. Number five, innovations for productive soils, land, and water, and to protect the agriculture genetic base and biodiversity. Six, um, this was not supposed to be only a terrestrial summit. So we emphasized sustainable fisheries and aquaculture and protection of coastal areas and oceans. Um, next week, uh, uh, we have a conference on oceans in the Vatican Academy, and uh, two weeks later is the UN Ocean Summit, so we need to connect these issues. And last, not least, digital innovations. Let me, for a moment, highlight three research findings which shaped the mindset in the context of the preparation for the summit. Number one, we need to better understand the true cost of food. Food in the market, in the global market, is about nine trillion US dollars per annum. But uh, the so-called true cost of food, factoring in the external effects, the indirect effects, together with the market value is 28 trillion US dollars per annum. About uh, uh, 8 trillion um, environmental externalities, so uh, ecosystem services, uh, uh, deforestation, and so on, um, um, and um, about uh, 12 trillion of uh, externalities in the health sector. We need to bring down these externalities. We need to internalize them, to put it academically. Unsustainable and unhealthy food is too cheap. Sustainable and healthy food is too expensive. That's the huge dilemma which we have. I want to put up a second scientific insight which shaped the agenda of the summit. We estimated the incremental costs of hunger reduction. There is no silver bullet in this field. It needs as a systems approach, as your food vision has it. There are some uh, actions, such as agricultural R&D, on the left-hand side of this marginal cost curve, as we call it, extension services, uh, information communication technologies, female literacies, um, social protection systems, which are low cost, high impact, which can bring millions of people at low cost out of hunger and undernutrition. But um, we cannot get the job done only with these measures. There are uh, measures which are more costly, 
um, and which need to be part of the portfolio, such as crop protection, such as um, uh, integrated soil fertility management, um, trade policy, and so on. I don't want to run through these um, uh, 25 plus measures, uh, but uh, the idea is important. We are confronted with an upward sloping marginal cost curve, um, but the bottom line is uh, to uh, get close to zero hunger by 2030 requires, according to these estimates, an additional needed investment of 30 billion, about 30 billion dollars per annum. So um, um, that's not much money. Let me come to a third um, scientific uh, insight. We need to understand the synergies and trade-offs um, of any policy action when we address um, the Food System Summit uh, issues, the SDG um, uh, targets. This table gives you um, red, yellow, and green colored um, uh, information about each action. Let me just pick one. If we put um, adapting, adopting healthy diets high up on our agenda, you see it will be good for food availability. It may have price effects, so there is a red shaded uh, uh, color in the food access um, area. It will be good for smallholders, and it is unclear how it will impact um, on environmental outcomes. So we need to get serious on synergies and trade-offs, and for that we need to work with solid models. So these are is a synthesis paper from the best modeling exercises on how to get the jobs done. Let me move on and um, highlight what we believe. Of course, this is a biased statement, as I was part of the scientific group, but your organizers have asked me to speak about, hey, what has come out of this scientific group work? Um, I think uh, these four points are very important to make. Number one, we established credibility within the science community, the social science and natural science. When I say science, I always mean the two a credibility, uh, and um, that was um, important um, uh, for uh, giving an evidence-based credibility to the overall summit. Number two, we mobilized the global science community. We had meetings with up to 3,000 participants. Uh, Ismahane was uh, uh, key in uh, co-organizing that. Third, we established independent interaction with governments, private sector, uh, farmer organizations, indigenous knowledge communities. So we had direct interactions with the world farmers, um, interactions with the, their youth uh, members, and uh, a series of three intensive interactions with the indigenous knowledge communities, who, by the way, for the first time, raised their voice very clearly in this summit. Uh, so it was not just a summit of nations, of uh, government delegates. It was not just a summit of stakeholders uh, and, and traditional interest groups, but the indigenous people claiming, hey, we are 400 million people, hear our voice. And it was, I think, heard quite clearly. What came out of this? Well, um, if you look into the statements of um, the 163 countries which have state made statements on the summit, science, technology, innovation, and research circled here came out very high on their preference agenda, what needs uh, to be our top priorities. And if you um, read um, the UN Secretary General's uh, five pages of uh, action, um, science and research is written all over the place. Well, that is output, but it is not yet outcome. Outcome, you will organize, for instance, for Ireland with your uh, vision by, by getting things done. But for a summit, um, this was a, a strong impact. Well, um, this was a caricature painted by the caricaturist um, um, who was um, at the 
uh, science days where we brought together 3,000 plus uh, academics. You see from the, less, uh, some, from the left uh, the FAO DG and then the Deputy De uh, Secretary General Amina Mohammed and Agnes Kalibata was already mentioned and yours truly without a beard on the right. So um, uh, we try to communicate, that's what uh, is the message. We need to communicate with the general public um, and um, because we cannot um, do science in the ivory tower. How does the public and private research and in innovation system need to act now after the summit? There is, um, sorry for this complicated graph, but that is the institutional setup established by UN leadership to follow up on the summit with a so-called hub. And there is um, a little box for science, a science ecosystem of support. But I should highlight the music plays here at the bottom. Country level implementation country level implementation. That's why your uh, strategy in Ireland is so important, country level implementation. But I hasten to say we cannot do it country by country only. Countries need to learn from each other, the development cooperation, uh, the UN agencies like FAO um, have a key role to play to connect uh, countries level implementation and mobilize the resources. The uh, concept for that is we need to mobilize now science at the country level, at the regional and global levels, and connect the two. So I hope that the Irish innovation system connects to other countries' innovation system, not only in Europe, but globally, especially in the so-called global south. Let me come to my closing remarks on preliminary assessment of the UN Food System Summit and open issues. How do you assess a summit? Well, let's be fair. Uh, how about a little bit of benchmarking? There were six summits before. This is number seven. How does this one fare compared to the previous summits? I think pretty good. Pretty good. The previous summits were largely hunger summits. 1943, FAO was founded. The massive hunger created uh, uh, by uh, the uh, Second World War uh, and Germany um, and uh, uh, world in trouble. Um, I don't go through these summits now, but each of them had an impact, Fair, at least um, um, some significant impact. Um, was in um, 1963, the massive famines in uh, in South Asia, 1974, follow up to Bangladesh famine, Sahel famine, uh, food price crisis, and there were uh, um, uh, institutions created as a consequence, not just talk shops. By the way, if you flip um, in your internet to 1963, listen to John F. Kennedy's uh, speech at that summit, uh, a friend of Ireland, I believe. Um, it's still a very good talk. Um, anyway, um, the uh, Food System Summit was triggered by lack of progress in SDG 2, by the COVID, by the climate crisis, and now it was uh, um, also, of course, taken over by the war in Ukraine. The positive out outcomes are these five. Political and societal engagement at scale. None of the previous summits has achieved that to this extent. Two, a food system focus, bringing in the environment agenda. Three, the science engagement. Four, an action agenda. And five, national level implementation. The unfinished business are these four, in my opinion. Strengthening the capacities for national level implementation of actions in emerging economies. I was delighted to hear the minister speak about capacity at least two or three times. Secondly, developing a strong finance agenda. That's where the summit failed, in my opinion. Um, World Bank, IMF, um, regional development banks were not um, 
uh, stepping up to the plate, um, but uh, uh, I believe uh, action is now coming with uh, uh, especially action also from the World Bank in the context of the G7 Alliance for Food Security spearheaded by uh, Germany uh, this year, uh, with, uh, which is mobilizing billions. Number three, establish improved science policy interfaces. So this must not be a one-shot event, science and policy coming together. And four, facilitating synergies with other key areas, climate policy, COVID-19, trade policy, peace and security, and the current food crisis. A litmus test for the food system summit is um, how are we today dealing with the crisis, uh, which the moderator already highlighted. The price crisis, the export disruptions, the security, and, and uh, you know about the key role of Ukraine and Russia after the attacks uh, from Russia. The harbors blocked 30% uh, of world wheat trade is not uh, coming out. And, um, but you see on the smaller graph here on the right, we had already price increase and price volatility um, in the context of the value chain disruptions um, uh, in, the, in the COVID-19 period. We are confronted with governance challenges and uh, we should look to Ireland and others to deal with these complex issues. The UN established a set of committees and task forces, that's good, the G7 established what I just mentioned, the Alliance for Food Security um, uh, with the UN, not separate, that's new, that's good, and with G20. But there are superpower food dissonances which are very serious in this situation between China, Russia, the US, India export ban uh, to be mentioned. Um, Low-income developing countries did the right thing during the COVID crisis. They pushed up their social security spending and got into debt, deep, deep debt. You know Sri Lanka is uh, into deep troubles now. So this was not um, uh, creating debt uh, for... Um, um, corruption reasons, it was for good reasons. We need to get into debt res rescheduling. Civil society and NGOs uh, provide significant initiatives, but the consumers in industrial countries, I can uh, speak for instance uh, uh, about what's happening in Germany, want compensation for the high inflation, the energy price and the food price inflation. Um, well, we need to share the burden of scarcity in the rich countries. Of course, we need to compensate poor and low-income households in our countries. But um, uh, if we are not sharing in the scarcity, um, we are further driving up uh, food prices um, uh, at the uh, nutrition costs of the poor. And we are missing in this situation a continuation of a sound science policy interface. By the way, you see this graph there. In the last five years, continuously food prices have gone up. Let me close by highlighting policy actions to address the global food crisis in 2022. Short-term actions are required. Um, keep food and fertilizer markets open. Avoid restrictive trade policies. It's not happening. WTO has not been able to do that. It needs um, getting strengthened. We need grain stock releases, including from uh, those who have stocks, uh, including Europe. Short-term changes in food production. We reduce bioenergy and the food, uh, feed use. And social protection and nutrition actions in low-income countries. But the long-term investments must not be neglected. The investment in uh, food system infrastructure and R&D. The word food system lives of innovation. 80% of productivity increases are from innovation. 20% are more resource use. Um, that needs to be even 
a higher share. So let me conclude. These were my questions. I look forward to our discussion later on, and thank you for your attention.